Of course, as uh, Ceci was saying, totally inspired and pushed by our dear Pedro Tarak, and now conformed in this first moment by uh, business uh, leaders from Argentina, Chile, Colombia, and Uruguay, but not any business leaders, but leaders that are absolutely committed to carry the B uh, in, their, in the center of their spirit, in the center of what moves them. Uh, and, and, and speaking to a climber now, I would like then to refer to what it means to climb with that spirit, with that capacity of challenging yourself as you're, as, as you're challenged by the mountain. Um, let, me, let me explain how I envision the role of the Corporate B Council uh, uh, using some learning from this year. So this year, I've learned that those leaders that uh, sex are succeeding somehow on confronting the pandemic have three elements I would say in common. The first one is that they are following science. They are understanding the importance of science and they are being capable of following it. The second one is that they have a real deep uh, capacity of empathizing, right? The, the capacity of embedding empathy uh, is absolutely something critical in those leaders. And the third one is that our leaders are cap capable of collaborating with others. So I really envision this space, this corporate B Council, as a space that should serve us to share evidence as we do as business leaders. Also to increase our empathy through others' eyes and feet. And also as a, as a space that should serve us to collaborate and learn to collaborate with others. So Emmanuel, for me, and I have no problem sharing this with all of the group here and anybody that can learn, uh, can listen, you are for me a leader that has been has had this capacity of leading with the soul in the center. You're a leader with purpose. Uh, we we are all the time searching for people that are that are capable of chewing gum and walk at the same time. You know how to chew and and and, and walk at the same time by putting the purpose and the profit at the same time. Uh, so let me thank you for your commitment for the people, towards the people and the planet for being able to ask and answer the hard questions that in this group are very properly exemplified by the B impact assessment. Uh, so, so the first question that I would like to, to give you uh, for your answer is what, what, what motivated you to start the B road with Danone and how can we accelerate the incorporation of large multinationals like Danone into the B Corp movement? Well, thank you, Gonzalo. Thank you for the warm welcome, and uh, it's a, it's a real pleasure, not to say a joy, of um, you know being a participant in in this group. I think just before was highlighting this point of interdependence uh, that bonds together the B Corps. And when you become a B Corp, you sign a letter of interdependence. Uh, I think you know we are all interdependent here, and uh, and so I'm glad that I can draw a bit of your energy as well back into my own uh, endeavors of, of the day. So thank you for your enthusiasm and your uh, high spirits about uh, all of these. I think what, uh, what led Danone a number of years ago to, uh, to start the journey with B Corp is that the company has been run on uh, this vision that it had a dual purpose, an economic and a social purpose together, a so social project we were saying. And when I, you know, we, we, we've been searching about uh, new governance models for uh, the, 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 the late uh, 2000s. So in 29, 10, 11, I went to California to meet the people that had started the copyleft movement, uh, the, the multiple purpose corporation movement, lawyers that had you know, been doing this, the public benefit corporation uh, things. And I took them back and I was thinking, wow, it would be great if, you know, we could one day think about becoming a company like this one. And in the middle of that, I crossed um, the, the path of the B Corp movement in 2014. And, um, you know, I, I knew that one of our large peers had been having sort of early discussions with B Corp, but finally said, well, probably not for us, too complex, etc. And I said, well, I just called. And I called the founders of the B Corp movement. I said, well, here we are. 
uh, we'd like to partner with you because we can learn from you and you can maybe learn from us uh, ready to share the results um, of how a multinational company can also become a B Corp. Because if you are able to do that, then suddenly it's not only the small, super nice businesses and you know regional businesses that are absolutely fundamental, but you can have a bigger reach by having a few uh, big multinational companies. So that's how we, how we started. Uh, and why we started, I was, I was looking to find a way to express um, the vision of the company into the modern world. You know, finding standards, finding a common language, basically, and and the BIA was providing us a, a way to uh, benchmark ourselves to have the same KPI, the same language than the rest of the community, and therefore, um, you know, being able to speak outside of what we lived inside with our dual uh, project. Awesome, and and and. And Emmanuel, thanks for referring to what mobilized you uh, while bringing Danone closer to the big, the, the big Corp community, because that act of generosity that Danone brought in terms of we will be learning, but also we are here for you to learn uh, was absolutely fundamental. So I'm here representing all of the big Corp community around the world to thank you for that creates a new standard for the movement. And, 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 and please don't forget the second part of the, of the question. Uh, how, how would you think we can accelerate bringing other ones, uh, other multinationals? Do you see any tip there? Yeah, well, I think the, um, uh, what, what, what we immediately started when we started in 2015 was uh, participate in the inception of the multinational council. Uh, there was an advisory committee, MNAC, uh, that was uh, sort of working on um, how the, the principles of B Corp could be applied to very large entities, entities that have maybe one century of history and therefore they have tax litigations, they have many kinds of litigations, they have legacy that might not be all positive, but, you know, and so how to learn uh, and transform these businesses into companies that could potentially become B Corp. So that was the first thing. And I think, um, you know, the kind of meeting that you're holding here and your idea of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, B, uh, you know, uh, System B, B uh, uh, Council is exactly the kind of thing that uh, that is useful to spread and to share the difficulties, the challenges, but also the opportunities that I'm sure we'll come to discuss. Then you, the, the, the B Corp, uh, uh, the B Lab people have created this great idea of uh, the movement builders. Uh, the B movement builders, uh, they are would-be companies. They are companies that would aspire to become, uh, but they don't know exactly when, they don't know, uh, you know how and if, but they are part of a, of a collective that is thriving to become a B Corp. And I, I think that works super well as well. And the final thing is probably, you know, just share. Um, we've been, um, you know, meeting with Egon Zander uh, one year before they this, you know, they became a B Corp. We've been meeting the Guardian uh, you know, leadership team one year before they become a B Corp. Because once we had made that statement, suddenly it you know, brought ideas to a number of people and, and, and the B Corp movement was instead growing. But as one of the big guys that were considering it, um, I think we were engaged in very interesting conversations where, again, we learned from them and probably they learned from us. We told them that it was not so difficult than one could think, really, and that it allows you to... Uh, ask yourself very interesting questions. The BIA is really fundamentally re-questioning why do you exist as a business? And I think for times like this one, this is a question that everyone should ask ourselves basically. So the way to accelerate and the tip is really to understand that um, you know, going for the B Corp journey is actually building the resilience of your business. It's not just to save the planet. It's also to save your business in this uh, you know, very uncertain world in which uh, we are. Amazing, thank you. So, so Emmanuel is now speaking to the climber. Uh, many times, our, our hardest summit or the crack in the glacier is, a, is the CFO of the company. Uh, and, and, and so I would like to listen from you. How do you measure and explain the sustainability return on the investment for, to the CFO? Or, or what are the, some tangible benefits uh, that has that Danone has somehow achieved by moving forward or becoming a certified B corporation? 
Well, I, I can give you uh, maybe not the biggest one, but the one that most precisely answer your question about the CFO. Uh, and it is that two years ago, uh, we renegotiated a syndicated uh, banking loan of 2 billion euros with 12 of the largest banks around the world. And um, we um, put into the conditions of the loans uh, a number of ESG metrics, two ESG metrics. One of them was uh, the percentage of our sales that were covered by the B Corp certification. And the, bank, the loan terms is that uh, the interest rate is going to decline over time as we increase the percentage of B Corp certification in our subsidiaries. So it's a very direct link because it meant that these 12 banks, you know, very serious people, not here to dream or to save the planet, just to make the good use of their clients' money that they are going to lend us. They've made a decision that if we are a B Corp, we uh, have a, a lower, a better credit rating and therefore a lower interest rate because probably we have less risk or we have more growth opportunities. But one way or the other, we are a less risky company. And that's, that's a fact. I mean, it was 12 of the largest banks and it's done and it was two years ago. So it's there that, um, you know, if, if you really point as to how becoming a B Corp serve your business resilience, then there is a convergence or at least there is a, a meeting point with the CFO, with the investors, with the financial world. It's not easy. But you know, this example is a very concrete one. It's 2 billion euros. It's not 20 billion, but it's a lot of money. Well, this is a moment when in the parallel world where we'll be in person, people will stand up and we'll have an amazing round of applause. I'm sure about that. So <laughs> <laughs> absolutely concrete. And thank you. And, uh, and let's go to this year that has been so challenging and, and, and we have been suffering from all around the world, of course, Many people have lost their lives and, and health and jobs. Uh, and that has positioned everybody and, and of course the business sector into the a new challenge. How do you see the, the, the role of business in, in the transformation of the national and global economy in these COVID times or maybe even after COVID? Yeah, the one thing I would say is that um, um, you know, for, for us, uh, we looked at uh, these governance topics as an accelerator for Danone to uh, serve the world better, our stakeholders, shareholders better in the COVID world than before. So we decided um, that we would accelerate our B Corp agenda as, as some of you know, uh, we, we are aiming at becoming a, a B Corp as a company by 2030. We accelerated that to become a B Corp by 2025. And today we have about 50% of our subsidiaries uh, or our sales uh, that are covered by the B Corp uh, certification. So we saw becoming a B Corp as being part of, you know, being part of the solution basically earlier than, uh, than, than before. The second thing that we did was to enable that B Corp certification to happen uh, and to flow even more naturally as part of our governance, we opted this year for uh, the new uh, kind of public benefit corporation status in France that is called Entreprise à Mission, so mission uh, company, basically, a company with a mission um, that is putting our mission in the bylaws with indicators that are going to be reviewed by an independent committee of experts and shared outside um, on, on our impact. Um, and we, we have actually been uh, uh, able to get a 99% support by uh, the 100,000 shareholders of Danone, uh, which, which I think speaks again to the previous point that, uh, you know, if people understand the connection with the resilience of the business, then why wouldn't they agree to this idea? So I'm a bit long on this, but this is to say that I think that being, uh, you know, or thriving to become a B Corp and questioning the impact that we have on the broader stakeholders uh, than shareholders um, as a business is part of uh, being able to be part of the solution. Now, to your uh, broader question on, um, you know, how business can be part of the solution, I'll put it this way. Um, 
I think that um, the, the there is there is no way that there can be a resilient solution without business being fundamentally part of the solution. Um, our democracies, um, the way we live, our societies rely on market economy, and market economy uh, cannot be part of the problem. We have to be part of the solution. Otherwise, again, there will not be a resilient recovery. There may be you know, some better GDP growth for a couple of quarters, maybe a couple of years, but the problem will stay. And the problem that we have with this crisis is that it's a big reminder that we have gone on a, a wrong track in many ways, uh, a growth that is not inclusive enough, uh, not socially inclusive, not climate inclusive enough, not nature inclusive enough. And uh, governments won't be able to solve the problems alone. NGOs won't be able to solve the problems alone. NGOs rely on money to, you know, and money comes from value creation. Value creations comes market economy. So businesses uh, have absolutely a fundamental role to play. And one of the aspects which I, I truly believe is, uh, you know, as I just said before, is so important in, in the B Corp movement is this notion of interdependency. We cannot act alone. I think the way businesses can be really supportive of the uh, of a resilient recovery is the coalitions is you know is putting things together and work as industry leaders in in countries as what you guys are doing in latin america you know the the, the recovery in latin america is going to be different from north america and, and obviously from china and from europe so this notion of being local i think is absolutely fundamental um and and as such uh, i think you know, businesses can, and, and we, you, you see that basically uh, in a number of cases already, uh, a number of large brands have actually crossed um, the, the, the bridge of going beyond regular business, you know, by really committing to do more. And people are expecting now, um, you know, in, uh, employees at, at Danone, and, and I'm sure in, in many other companies, employees are expecting us to do more. I expecting us to give them time for volunteering to help and support in the recovery in their local communities, for instance. Um, they, they, so they expect us to be more inclusive when we speak with our farmers or with you know, way speakers or street vendors in Mexico, for instance. Um, so there is this expectation that business has fundamentally in this huge loss of trust overall that comes around the world, um, there is, I think, a relative strength of businesses if we behave in a way that's uh, really creating value for all, uh, an ability, and, and therefore, I think, a responsibility for us as businesses to truly act fully as um, you know the main actors of uh, the, the creating the solution for the future. Wow, profound. And, uh, and, and a great example of how uh, not only Danone is a purpose-driven company and entrepreneurs, the a mission. Uh, I, someday I will pronounce it properly in, in French, but, uh, but also how you as a CEO uh, works on a daily basis, mobilized by a purpose. And, and in so many cases, we see a dissonance there where people tend to divide, right? One is the... CEO, the role, the person that is uh, playing that role in the in in in, uh, in the in, in the job, but also uh, there's a, sometimes a, a differentiation with the own individual. How is your personal mission as a CEO of the known, and how much it might differ from Emmanuel's mission as a person? Is there a tension there? Or how do you manage the potential tension? Well, that's a very intimate question, my friend. Uh, well, we're in an intimate space, but uh, but you can oh, go yeah, as far yeah. as far there, as far as you want. Don't worry. I I I, I forgot it was so intimate. Um, um, what I'm yeah, I mean, I'm I'm basically stri thriving um, to the point that there would not be a difference. That I'm basically acting as one person you know that's what i like about climbing you cannot lie to yourself if you lie to yourself you fall it's immediate 
So it's how strong you are, how balanced you are, how much there is wind, you know, how focused you are. You focus, you know, millimeter by millimeter or one meter by one meter or looks at the next hundred meters. But, you know, you, I mean, when I climb, I feel I'm totally committed. Not my mind only, not my calculation only, not my brain only, my whole body. My whole body and more profoundly, my whole soul, my whole being is there. I'm connected to this piece of rock in the middle of the wind and the air, and I'm fully there. And that's why I, I find it you know, such an important experience for me because um, this is also the way I'm trying to behave as a manager. You know, I have this responsibility. I've been given this responsibility for some time. Uh, you know, others were before me, others will be after me, and I'm here to serve. And that, that's the whole question, which is really, what do we do with our power? You know, what, what do we want to serve with this power? Um, and yes, I'm finding my inspiration in, in trying to behave um, as one person and not as, you know, wearing a suit and then, you know, being a, a father or a friend or a husband or a partner, or whatever, and then a climber. I'm trying to be the same one. And of course, as you just said, it's full of huge tensions. It's much easier to be, you know, playing the money game on one side and then, you know, be another person on the other side. It's, I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying it's so much easier. So this is the North Face. I mean, trying to trying to be just one person is, you know, is is terribly difficult because of you know what what powers comes with and you know the the the, the, the very difficult uh, challenges that we have to face, which is that you know, having nice ideas when you write a book or when uh, you're in a retreat somewhere is, is great. But then suddenly you're facing the tough reality of tough negotiations with everyone. Um, and this is where I think that the, the lifeline for me is to uh, make, uh, I, I, how could I say that? Uh, to, to make compromises, but never compromise. I, I don't know if mm. how I can say that in English and certainly not in Spanish, but never cross that red line. I mean, but, but of course I have to, I have to, I mean, just realize that, uh, and actually a lot of time I'm realizing that I just need to rely on others. I mean, I, the, the, the consciousness and the awareness of other people around me is really what will bring the change. It's not me forcing them to change. There's no way I can tell you, you, you need to change. No, no, I need to change myself. And, you know, this consciousness and, and allowing other people, this patience in a way for, I'm, I'm a pretty impatient person, but I'm, I'm learning every day, every morning, how more patient I should be just to make sure that other people are also, you know, getting aware of stuff. And, and by, by listening to them, I'm also getting something. I'm also, you know, more precise in what I should think. I'm refining my view of things. And because the truth at the end will be in this very detailed dialogue when, you know, when we, we agree on something. And so let's agree on this small piece and build something from that. That, that, that is the sort of what I'm saying about compromising. Not, so not compromising with my principles, but really be ready to, to sort of let it go when my vision is not going to be put in place immediately, maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years, but who knows, I'm here to try. And so, yeah, I agree that it's full of tension, but for me, that's what makes um, you know, me excited about this job and this responsibility. I'm, I'm blessed with the trust of, of many people and I'll try to serve as, as long as they believe and I believe that I'm the right person and I don't know how long it will be. Well, th thanks so much for sh sharing such wise words and mostly for sharing that connection between your mind and your and your soul. Uh, as I think that that tension exists permanently in most of us, if not all of us, and right. and it's and, and I think it's great to share the example that we are uh, fragile in so many aspects, and it's so great when you find that connection. So, thanks so much for that, and uh, and let's speak to. to about another aspect that we both share that it's uh, it's broken. You, you're oftenly stating that the food system is broken, right? I'm a farmer myself. I, uh, I, I understand what you ref you're referring to, but I would like you 
you to please share with with the group what do you think should change and in particular what the role of agriculture could play in the future yeah well that's i could be very long on this one so <laughs> I know. Even longer than other other topics so let, let me try to be brief and we can go through questions if uh, there is any need um i think the as an industry um you know over the last hundred years through um, technology or technique, uh, a bit of science, um, with economies of scale, uh, we've been able to bring the cost of food down to a point um, that uh, affordable, uh, reasonably good food has been available to billions of people. Um, and this is really what has made the success of companies like ours and, and a number of other large companies today. Um, but we, we had blind spots, you know, we didn't see some problems. We, we were not aware of some problems and now they are very clear. Obesity is there, uh, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and, and certainly in Latin America, in the, in the U S and in a growing number of countries, it's, it's a, it's a tragedy overweight is there and there is no way for me that we can say industry doesn't have as i said before you know, business can be part of the solution recognizing that we can be part of the problem too so you know sugar intake fat intake salt intake the diabetes you know you know 700 million people with diabetes around the world that's the kind of uh, unintended consequences of the food system that we have built and on the other side we did not know Uh, of climate change. We did not know that carbon existed, that greenhouse gas existed 50 years ago. We felt that, uh, you know, using chemicals and entrants and everything was going to be okay. But then now we learned. And the question is, no one is guilty. I'm not saying, uh, but, but simply just recognize that this is not a system that can last because it's going to a, a dead end. You know, the soils uh, are being uh, eroded by monoculture in, in many places uh, over irrigation. Uh, the, 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 the extraction of carbon out of the soil is ruining the soil structure, its nutrients, but also its ability to keep water. So water is, is you know, flowing down um, and, and, you know, it, it, it's a waste in, in many ways. I was, you know, I'm, uh, I, I quote often this example of the Colorado River that comes to Mexico and it's so salty when it comes to Mexico because of the over irrigation and the fact that there are lots of chemicals in, into it and nitrate, et cetera, that it's got to be treated at the border of Mexico, uh, being desalted and then used in Mexico and overused again so that it doesn't even go to the Gulf of California. It dies before the Colorado River. And it's true in so many cases. So. There is a fact that the current agriculture model is, is, is ruining the soil's health. And if you do not care uh, about soil health, then there is no food because everything starts with the health of soil. Everything is in these 30 to 60 centimeters below our feet. That is basically where uh, the food for the human uh, you know, beings and nature is. And so the role of agriculture is incredibly positive. And that's what I would like to say, which is that, you know, we, we tend, when we think about carbon and climate, we all, 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 always speak about industry and you see these photographs of chimneys and smokes and et cetera. The, the bad thing is um, that industry, you know, the agriculture is about the same size of emission than the whole of industry. It's about the same net emissions, about 18, 20% of total emissions on industry, 18, 20% on agriculture. But there is one thing magic that agriculture can do is capture carbon because the carbon that is emitted by the oil industry will never go back into the pit, the oil pit where it started and, and, and belongs. Whereas the carbon that is emitted by agriculture can actually go back in the soil and become the nutriment of the soil. Because for those who are not familiar, but carbon is about 60% of the organic matter in the soil. So the nutrient for the soil and the plants, 60%. So the more you put carbon back into the soil, the, you, the more you restore soil health, basically. And we can do that through regenerative agriculture. 
in many, many practices that exist, agroecology, you know, no tillage, uh, intercrops, crops rotations, biodiverse uh, crops, etc. change in the way we raise cattle and everything. All of this are, the, for me, the agriculture of the future that is going to be one of the biggest uh, drivers of positives against climate change. So, and I, I think it's uh, very, uh, you know, important because uh, the, the sector that is most affected today by climate change is already agriculture. We know all around the place that we need to change the seeds that we use because they won't be able to have the same yields given the increase in temperature. There won't be water available to farm the way we do in many places around the world as well. So already um, uh, agriculture is being hit by climate change, but it can respond in a very, very effective manner if we change the agricultural practices, which means we change also the government practices. We, we need to change the subsidies that goes to chemical and insurance instead of going to biodiversity positive subsidies, for instance, because nature works for us in agriculture. And so there is a whole program of restoring agriculture and making sure that, as I, I said before, it's part of uh, the solutions and not part of the problem. Absolutely amazing. And, uh, and thank you for sharing that passion, Emmanuel, for it's not only passion that then is followed by action, but it's followed by business and profit. And, uh, and, and we are absolutely uh, aware of how much of the good businesses will also be done through regenerative agriculture. Let me refer yes. to that because I would say one year ago and even less than one year ago, uh, the concept was very uh, uh very, I mean, not very known, I would say, and not very respected in this year. And in many cases, due to the work that you have been doing around the world, it's absolutely resonating everywhere. So thank you for that. Hopefully that we will be seeing much more about that in the near, yeah. in the really near future. Uh, going, going to concrete examples, uh, can you share with us the, the example that comes to your mind first when it comes to triple impact story. So how do you deliver social, environmental, and financial positive impact through one concrete example? Yeah, um, one thing I, I can, you know, I mentioned earlier the, the impact that we were having on uh, waste speakers and street vendors. Um, actually talking to your, your group of people around here and sharing um, our Latin American teams have been incredibly committed, uh, you know, passionately committed about this triple impact in, in Argentina, in Brazil, in Mexico in particular. And um, we have a number of uh, those initiatives. Uh, one of them is uh, the Cartoneros project that we have in Argentina, where basically uh, we are um, uh, working with uh, an NGO um, and the uh, local authorities to uh, build a system for the waste pickers that collect, um, including for us, the, the PET bottles that we can recycle and then use for our, uh, bottles of water for Villa Vicenzo, Villa del Sur, our, our brands in, uh, in Argentina. Um, and, um, and we are basically bringing these people into a situation where they have a safer uh, working condition ergonomically. Uh, the, you know, they wouldn't be just sitting in the, in the garbage and just picking the waste. They would be working on tables, not under the sun. Uh, you know, they would be in, in a building. They would have a social network, a social, uh, sorry, safety network, uh, insurance. Uh, they would have a decent wage, um, you know, some coverage, etc. And therefore, um, it's a project, uh, Counter is a project where there are already several thousands of waste pickers engaged for I think we started uh, maybe not 10 years ago, but seven, eight years ago uh, with, with that one. Uh, we have one called Novo Ciclo that does about the same uh, um, in, uh, in Brazil, another one in Mexico, in Indonesia, in China. So these, these would be the sort of elements. The good thing about it is if I look at Indonesia, for instance, where we started that uh, nearly 10 years ago, we are now able to secure a sourcing of uh, a recycled PET, which becomes uh, fancy because many you know, companies now are trying to go for recycled material as opposed to virgin oil, um, you know, PET. Um, we, we have our own source uh, that allows us to buy uh, with more, a better predictability on the volume and also on the price. 
So um, we are able to buy at a lower price today, at sourcing at a lower price and, and more resilient than buying on the market because the market spot has been you know, super high. So we also have a, an economic benefit. We have a climate benefit because it, it, it allows to not use uh, virgin oil uh, in doing this. It has a social benefit, the one I described, and it has this economic benefit that we actually source with a reliable source, a resilient source at a cheaper price than going to buy spot. So this would be one example, but we have also a lot in, uh, in farming, for instance, and, and a number of other, uh, um, you know, we, we're basically working on the question of the, the job footprint of Danone. And we know our job footprint is way beyond the strict base of our employees because we impact with a lot of the smaller um, you know, um, uh, micro actors that operate around the company and we depend on them and they depend on us. And this is why we are, you know, working on um, uh, building up their capacity, not, not because we want to save the planet or to go for social justice, because it's better resilience for our business as well. So it's this mutual interdependence again that makes us uh, stronger if we pay attention, pay resources, uh, share the, the you know what we can share together. Brilliant, and 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 great to understand from the known experience that this is something that is being well received and celebrated by even the shareholders and 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 the broader financial institutions. So, uh, speaking about broader in audience, uh, we have some some questions from the the group that has joined us. So here. Uh, let, let me, I mean, we can write it, uh, read them together uh, from Nicolas Cook. How, how to promote and accelerate? Uh, let me go with that one. I don't know. I was reading the one from Nicolas uh, Giselle or, okay. I'll, I'll... Don't, keep it, no, keep it, keep it quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one. How to promote and accelerate triple impact in international commerce, so in, in trading, right? Do you have any idea about that? I mean, you move products from all around the world. Great question, Nicolas. Yeah, thank you, Nicolas. It's a very tough question, to be honest. Uh, and if, if you look at what uh, international commerce looks like now and the discussions around who is going to be the next head of the WTO and Gozi Okonjo Ibuela or not, um, that's a huge question. I think uh, international commerce right now is under the, th you know, the threat of becoming back to trade wars uh, that we've seen. Um, personally, I think that consumers have a huge responsibility and ability to change uh, the, this topic. We've seen that with fair trade, um, you know, I'm just using one example. Uh, we see that as well in, in our own brands. People want to understand the kind of agriculture that our products is, is uh, you know, is made of. Uh, was it deforested or was it not deforested? And so as consumers, as citizens, I think this is how we should be able to change. And I think brands should engage on that journey as well. So, um, you know, using the power of brands uh, to make clear choices on, on impacting those, I think is critical. I have a, a couple of examples uh, within Danone that I won't share for, for reasons of time, but I know a lot of other companies and I certainly know a number of B Corps companies that are doing exactly that, mobilizing their, their force. Uh, you know, you, you look at what Patagonia does, for instance, and, and many much smaller ones. I think that's exactly that, mobilizing people's force as a, as a, as a force to change. Great, thanks so much. Let's go for the one that Tomas de Lara uh, has, uh, uh, wrote. Um, dear Emmanuel, could you share with us how Danone yeah. is using the SDG Action Manager tool and its alignment yes. with the SDG? Yes, I mean, we, we've been so excited uh, with the SDG Action Manager uh, thing that we, you know, we, we were supporting this because we, on one side, we had this agenda of uh, you know, nine integrated goals for 2030 that are aligned with the UN goals. And uh, we were looking for a way to bridge it with uh, the way we do our business. And on the other side, we had the BIA of B Corp. And so we've, we've really been um, looking for this SDG uh, action manager, which is bridging the two together. So in a way it's a proxy that, or it's a, you know, a plug that allows you to plug the two together. 
And so for us, it allows us to make the link between our 2039 integrated SDG goals and what we do in each subsidiaries with the BIA. We know how to impact and how it impacts one to the other. So it's a tool for aligning our initiatives and understanding the impact that they have relative to our global goals. Perfect. Um, Marcel here, what risks do you see oops, to achieve an economic recovery towards an inclusive and regenerative system? What suggestions you leave for other leaders to address it? Um, I'm not sure about the qu what exactly the question means in terms of risk to not achieve that or... If I, I would say that, I, I would interpret it that way. What are the risks of not okay. right, incorporating... Well, the risks are, the risk are tremendously high and they are, they are true for everyone, including for myself, I, I, I can tell you. I mean, we will need to adapt the company big time to the, to the COVID that has hurt our business models in many ways. Uh, the way we do business, the way we, you know, we sell our products... Uh, the cost of doing business is, is increased. So there is no doubt, and we have announced that already, that we will need to you know, radically adapt to be thriving in this COVID world. So it takes uh, long-term, I would say it takes long-term uh, view to invest in the change. And uh, what I can see is that there, are, there is a huge economic, um, or put, uh, pr there is a huge pressure from uh, the financial market to go back to normal as soon as possible, from governments to go back to normal in terms of GDP growth as soon as possible, even though we know that GDP growth is, is a limitation. GDP is, is not carrying much in terms of resilience uh, or all the principle of B Corps. And, and therefore, I think the risk is that there will be political pressure and financial pressure to achieve a fast recovery and not a, a long lasting recovery. So yes, big risk. Um, uh, what can I tell you? I mean, um, the, you are talking about the tension. That's exactly the tension that I think as leaders we need to face. How much are we going to invest for the longer term and how much are we going to have to deliver for the short term? There is no one uh, you know, answer to that, but I think this, this question is, uh, you know, has never been bigger than it is today for me. Really clear. Let's go to, to this other, like, <clears throat> hard to answer question coming from our dear Pedro Tarak. How can we increase our shareholder value reducing wealth concentration in few hands? Wow. <laughs> it's a hot potato. Um, diversifying shareholders, probably. One thing I can tell you, and it's an easy thing to do, I guess, is that we've decided at Danone that. Uh, each of our employee would be a shareholder. Uh, so we gave um, you know, each employee one share of Danone. Together the, with this one share of Danone comes um, a dividend access scheme where they get 40 times the dividend, uh, the, the nominal dividend. And so you know, we, we allow these people who are not shareholders to become shareholders. Um, and with that comes also a vote. They have a voice. The program is called One Person, One Voice, One Share. They have a voice that they express um, every year on the agenda of the strategy of the company. And that is then being discussed, the, the 100,000 people, they express their voice and they send representative to discuss with the board of the company about the, what the priorities should be. So it's, it's basically trying to bring not only you know, wealth, but also power concentration in a broader uh, space within the company. And I guess that's probably a way, I mean, we've been thinking some, you know, some of our businesses, I've got a few examples of our businesses where they have also brought the farmers as shareholders of some of our businesses. So if you, if you think about diversifying the shareholder base, um, I think you can you know, increase the shareholder value, but also making sure that it's being shared with a broader um, you know, population at the end of the day. Thanks. Great, great. And, uh, and, and to go to start closing, I know we, we have only three minutes more. I would like to thank you so much, Emmanuel. Would like you to please first send a, a very concrete message to uh, the, the members of the uh, Business Council uh, what, what would be your very concrete and personal message to them? And also a quick question, like if 
if you were a member of the B, B Business Council and had to choose a company in the world to motivate to become a certified B Corp, which one would you choose? Just one. But remember, please, to also send a message for, for this group of businessmen that, and business uh, people, business women that are yeah. here listening to you. Well, when it comes to, to one company, um, we have had already discussions with a few of the largest financial institutions in the world. Uh, banks, including banks, you know, thinking about the B Corp movement. No one has jumped in at this point in time um, among the majors. And so I would not point one, but, y you know, I think that um, some sh very large financial institutions could become B Corp. Some others would make an incredible impact if they became uh, a B Corp. And so I would definitely push for a financial, one of the largest you know, shareholders, financial investment funds in the world. You can pick whatever name you want. Um, and I'm ready to support if um, anyone wants that. Now to the, to the tribe around us here, uh, a huge thank you for uh, having me you know, with, with you. Um, I'm living this, this hour the same way as always uh, lived uh, with friends of the Big Hope movement. And, uh, you know, Gonzalo, I didn't know you, but I've known so many of um, the other Big Hope leaders. You're full of energy and, you know, your encouragements are incredibly useful, I can tell you. I, I think all of us around this call, we know how we can be, you know, how the world is tough these days, how lonely we can be exercising power. And I think this group of people together is, is uh, you know, a way to recharge your batteries, uh, you know, get more optimism, uh, look at the world in the way we can dream about it and not just reading the medias, which are full of all these terrible news. And so uh, my encouragement is really connect, uh, you know, and stay bonded all together because uh, you are a driving force. And, and, and again, I've been, I've been hearing about... Uh, uh, system Abbey for a long, long time. And uh, I can tell you, it's like this big chapter of the B Corp movement that's there in Latin America, super lively. And I'm, uh, I'm really happy to just know that you exist, my friends. It's a, it's a big encouragement. So thank you for being who you are and, uh, and enjoy the journey together. Thanks so much, Emmanuel, uh, for, for giving us the gift of, of being with you for for this hour and for the whole journey and the and what what has to come. Thanks, of course, for the known uh, for being with us in this event. Thanks uh, to B Lab Global and Juan Pablo Arenas for all the support and our media partners. Hub Sustentabilidad, El Pulso, La Tercera from Chile, La Nación de Argentina, El Observador de Uruguay. Everybody that is, has joined from Argentina, Chile, and, and Uruguay, and everybody that has assisted to to this. Uh, uh, gathering with Emmanuel from different medias. And, uh, and of course, uh, for everybody, uh, to everybody that has helped on setting this fantastic event, uh, as you all know, uh, we'll, we'll continue the journey with the members of the uh, business councils working on this first Latin American uh, gathering. So everybody, thanks so much and keep the hard work. Thank you, Emmanuel. Have a great uh, afternoon and weekend. Thank you and salute to my Danone and other partners colleagues that I see on this. Uh, thank you.